I spend a lot of time driving different cars I've never driven before, and sometimes in that process, something about the car really stands out and grabs my attention. I'm talking just from the first seconds of driving, and that was the case in this 2023 Toyota Crown, and I'm gonna show you exactly what that was a little later in this video after we stack this thing up against a half dozen of its competitors to help answer your most important questions about it. I'm Justin Pritchard, by the way. This is my 2023 Toyota Crown Deep Dive, Let's meet the machine. This is the new Toyota Crown. It only comes as a hybrid. It has standard all-wheel drive on all trim grades. It's a similar size to a Toyota Camry, and it comes in three configurations from about 45,000 Canadian dollars on the low side to about 60,000 Canadian dollars, totally decked out in the platinum trim grade. So it's Crown XLE starting the lineup with a base hybrid engine, a 236 horsepower hybrid four cylinder, which we'll dive into later, or the Hybrid Max, a turbocharged hybrid with 340 horsepower. You'll only find it in the top of the line Crown Platinum. My tester is the mid range limited, priced at 51000 with enhanced audio system, ventilated leather, a panoramic sunroof whose blast is not open, a heated steering wheel, rain sensing wipers, and multi beam LED lights, which I'll be showing you later on as well. Despite being very close in size to the Toyota Camry and launching just a year after Toyota discontinued the Avalon, the Crown's far higher pricing suggests that it's targeting a shopper willing to pay a premium for the most upscale yet take on a Toyota hybrid sedan. It's something more significant than your standard family Camry and a bold move at the same time, specifically by launching a new sedan into a marketplace where sedans are rapidly going extinct. The Toyota Crown is longer than a Toyota Camry or Nissan Maxima, whose lengths are separated by less than an inch, and also slightly longer than those is the Honda Accord, whose overall length is a virtual tie with the Crown at about 196 inches or 4908 millimeters. That's about 8 centimeters or 3 inches longer than the Maxima, by the way. The Dodge Charger is longer than the Crown by about 6 centimeters or 2.5 inches, and then there's the Volvo S90, which measures in at 2.5 inches or about 6 centimeters longer than the Charger. So in this competitive set of big comfortable sedans, that's the Camry Hybrid is the shortest with the longest, Volvo S90, coming in at nearly 9 inches or about 22 centimeters longer, which is about the width of two human hands. A Toyota Crown is wider than a Toyota Camry or Nissan Maxima, whose widths are separated by less than an inch or two and a half centimeters, and slightly wider than those is the Honda Accord, whose overall width is a virtual tie with the Crown. So that's about two centimeters or 0.8 of an inch wider than the Maxima. Compared to the Crown, the Dodge Charger is about two and a half inches or six and a half centimeters wider, and the S90 is about half an inch narrower than that. So the Camry is the narrowest, the Charger at 2.6 inches or 6.5 centimeters wider is the widest, and on height the Crown stands tallest amongst those peers, punching past 60 inches and coming in at the better part of 61 inches tall. That's about 154 centimeters, taller than an Audi Allroad but shorter than a Subaru Crosstrek, and a full 6 inches shorter than a Toyota RAV4 if you're wondering. This leaves the Dodge Charger's roof a full 2.4 inches or 6 centimeters closer to the road than the Crown's, with the Accord Hybrid an inch lower than that in a tie with the Volvo and Camry, and the Maxima sporting the lowest roofline of the group by just about half an inch or a centimeter. By the way, the Crown also has about an inch or two and a half centimeter advantage in ground clearance versus most competitors. To answer the original question, the Toyota Crown is almost exactly the same size as a Honda Accord, although it is taller when it comes to length, width, and wheelbase. The two are a virtual tie. But what about interior space? Amongst our competitive set, you'll find the Crown offers up almost exactly the same passenger volume as the Toyota Camry. The Dodge Charger has 4% more passenger volume, the S90 has 2% more passenger volume, and the Nissan Maxima has 4% less. The only substantial difference here is the Honda Accord, which offers up more than 22% more passenger volume than the Toyota Crown. 
Behind the wheel, it's Accord and Maxima tied for best front seat headroom in the group, with Camry, Charger, and Crown falling back slightly and separated by fractions of an inch. And that leaves the Volvo S90 with the lowest headroom measurement of the group. So to recap, it is the Nissan Maxima with the most headroom, the Volvo S90 with the least headroom, and a total span of about 1.6 inches or 4 centimeters when it comes to headroom across the group. In back, the Camry is the friendliest to taller passengers, followed by the S90. The Crown still manages to squeeze out a little more rear seat headroom than the Maxima or Accord though. On rear seat legroom, it's Accord and S90 tied for the lead, with the Charger on their tail. Then it's the Toyota Crown a good step behind, and the Camry Hybrid with slightly less rear seat legroom than that. And that leaves the smallest rear seat legroom measurement in the group to the Nissan Maxima by a considerable margin. On cargo volume, it's the S90 in lowest position with the Maxima in second lowest on the list. The Camry Hybrid and Crown are virtually tied in mid-pack position, with the Charger and Accord virtually tied for first place when it comes to cargo volume. If cargo volume is important to you, then bear in mind the Volvo S90 offers 11% less than the Crown, the Nissan Maxima offers 6% less than the Crown, and on the other side it's the Dodge Charger and Honda Accord Hybrid offering 9 and 10% more cargo volume than the Crown respectively. Earlier, I told you that one specific part of the Crown's drive really stood out for me right off the bat, and I've got those details coming up for you in this road test. So if you're considering spending the big bucks on a Toyota Crown, there are a few very important things to know about it, and many of those show up in the road test. If you're considering one of these, I think this will be the most important part of the video for you to watch. What I really want to get across is that this is a beautiful car to drive. I found smoothness and noise levels to be consistently well controlled, whether cruising the highway or rough and crumbly subway back roads. If you're lucky enough to do a lot of driving on smooth pavement that's in good condition, then you're in for a treat because the Crown capitalizes on this and turns in a ride that's very smooth, very refined, very comfortable, and often almost totally disturbance free. The tall ride height gives the suspension plenty of travel, and a specialized swing valve system inside the dampers helps make excellent use of that travel, controlling suspension movements in response to the vehicle's body position and the surface of the road. So in addition to strong control over road and suspension noise, even on rougher surfaces. This means ride quality is strongly maintained on even rougher roads, and even on the worst of these that I test cars on, the Crown's ride quality was excellent. So to summarize, I think shoppers will find a very strong return on their investment when it comes to surprisingly quiet and smooth and consistent ride comfort across a surprisingly wide range of road surfaces. Fun fact for you, the suspension system in this car was actually fine-tuned by Toyota's engineers to reduce occupant head movement on bumpy roads, and that's why I figure it's so darn comfy here. This 2023 Honda Accord Hybrid is a close competitor to the Toyota Crown, and I'll be giving you a deep dive comparison of these two models in a future video, so if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button down below so you don't miss any new uploads. But here's a preview, and what I can tell you is that over this very rough testing surface, the Accord rides like a Honda, and the Crown rides like a Lexus. When it comes to ride quality on very rough roads, this Toyota Crown might be one of the biggest surprises I've had this year. The safety systems are all here too, the Crown can help you stay in your lane, keep you distanced from other vehicles, and work to prevent certain types of accidents. I found these systems easy to work and monitor thanks to a simple two or three button operation, and handy on-screen infographics. No complaints from the system operation either, after over a thousand kilometers of highway cruising. I found their performance to be consistent and reliable, virtually seamless actually, with few if any abrupt inputs or false alarms to report. Before long, I found the Crown's safety systems to just work away in the background, reacting gently enough not to disturb my peaceful drive. And even with the cruise control disengaged, the Crown's ability to sense and react to traffic is apparent. The Crown can even subtly apply its brakes as you're approaching a slower car in traffic without the cruise control turned on. This has a way of reducing your workload and smoothing out the drive, while giving you a strong taste of the latest in safety tech every time you take the wheel. All right, so a couple of other things to show you in here too. Fully digital instrument cluster here, a joystick style shifter down here, that's left and down for drive, hold to the left for neutral, left and up for reverse, and if we want B for brake, which is like putting the transmission in low gear, then we just pull down like that. Drive mode selector behind it here, three different modes that we can toggle with this switch, easily referenced up here on the screen as well, sport, normal, and eco. Traction control off if we need it, EV mode, 
which allows you to drive at low speed for short distances just using battery power, and the auto hold button here, which is one of my favorite features because when you turn that on, it's referenced up in the instrument cluster, and once the vehicle stops, you can take your foot off of the brake pedal and the car won't go anywhere until you touch the accelerator again. USB ports here, wireless charging slot for your phone there. Handy center console lid here too, check this out. We can open this either way. So that's pretty handy. And let me get you up close to the central infotainment screen here for a better look at the graphics. This is the factory interface here. Nice sharp graphics, that screen doing a pretty good job of mitigating the glare. Easy to see in all conditions. Let me punch right in there so you can see just how sharp this is. By the way, if you want a great burger, Gonga's Grill, that's where you want to go. So nice sharp graphics there. I've got the Android Auto connected wirelessly on the upper right of the screen. And there's my Android Auto interface uh, with my maps and my Spotify and my contacts and other information I like exactly the way I left them on my phone. Earlier, I told you that one specific part of the Crown's drive really stood out for me right off the bat. That very strong first impression was from the steering, which I found to be delightfully quick even without using sport mode. Whether you're in a parking lot or cruising the highway, there's minimal work needed at the wheel to actually steer the car, which gives it a lively and eager steering feel almost regardless of the situation you're in. It means you steer the Crown more with your wrists and less with your arms and shoulders, and that's a surprisingly athletic touch you'll notice right away and enjoy on the daily. It has a way of helping make this big car feel like you're driving something a little smaller. My tester's standard hybrid engine with 236 horsepower and all-wheel drive should prove sufficient for most drivers. With a light foot, there's no trouble taking in plenty of all-electric driving in around town settings, with strong torque response and minimal noise other than the occasional presence or absence of the hum of the engine as it turns on and off. Blending gas and electric power isn't completely seamless or noiseless in a quiet cabin, but with the radio on a little, you'll barely hear a thing. Full throttle acceleration widens the eyes with the immediacy of the throttle response being more impressive than the overall pulling power. Keep your boot down and the crown charges ahead with a solid and steady push in your seat that stays on until you lift off. There are no gears to shift here, but the continuously variable transmission does simulate a convincing kickdown. The engine sounds relatively happy to be worked hard. I found it quieter than comparable Kia or Hyundai hybrids, but notably louder than comparable Honda hybrids. The brakes are generally easy to engage smoothly and inspire confidence during emergency stops with a strong bite and smooth pedal action, though you may experience the occasional squirm or sensation of vagueness from the pedal as the brakes combine hybrid regenerative braking and conventional hydraulic braking together on the other end of the pedal. Elsewhere, the next generation infotainment system is big, bright, and high-end, and there's no shortage of nearby storage and charge ports, and even a handy wireless charging slot for your phone. There is a shortage of headroom though, up front at 5'10 I was fine, but much taller than me and you can expect crowding. Same deal in the rear seat which has generous legroom but will run out of headroom quickly too. So make no mistake when you're comparing the specs, the Crown's tall ride height seems to have gone mostly to suspension travel and ground clearance, not interior headroom. Also, for the money, I could have done with sunroof glass that opens, some sharper graphics from the backup camera and instrument cluster, and maybe a smaller turning circle. The Crown does need some room to maneuver around, and with its okay but not great backup camera graphics, some competitors for the dollar are going to be easier to maneuver in tight quarters. After dark, drivers are backed by powerful LED headlamps with automatic high beams. From the driver's seat, the instrumentation is mostly clear and crisp in the dark, especially from the central infotainment display. Further ahead, the LED headlamps soak the forward scenery with clean white light that's easy on the eyes and has a good reach into tree lines and culverts with the low beams engaged. The auto high beams are a little slow to respond at times but generally work well and have impressive reach too. If I had just one wish about this lighting system, it would be for just a little more light a little higher from the road in city and residential nighttime driving, which can better engage reflective vests, jackets, and helmets that tend to sit a little higher from the ground. 